Okay, hello guys! This is my first official YouTube video, and I guess you could say the calling for that was, I believe it's a new moon tonight, a lot of feminine, energetic, um, vibes I would say going around, and I've been called several times to start doing my spiritual path and talking about everything that's going on. And so I want to take some time today to tell you a little bit about an experience I've had. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory and a little bit about me, and then we'll start from there. Um, my name is Corinne. Uh, I go by Gingy. Most know me as Gingy. I'm a hairstylist. I own a business called The Gingy Style, hence the Gingy name. Um, so I own a salon. I'm currently actually getting ready to move out of my new salon and um, find another salon due to finding having issues. Um, but I'm my dad's name is Jack, and a lot of people call me the Gingy of all trades because not only do I do hair, but I do spiritual events. Um, I also do marketing online and through Facebook. Um, so my trades are a little bit of everywhere, and so. I wanted to come out into the beautiful mountains today and talk to you guys, but unfortunately it's so windy out there that you guys won't be able to hear any of this that is going on today. I excuse excuse all this today because I had a little bit of a mental breakdown last night. And for me, finding pimples that are underneath the surface is what I love to do to get my mind off of things. So, again, I go by Gingy, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. So, what I want to tell you a little bit about is... Um, a little bit about my backstory. So I have been sober eight years officially as of January 22nd. Um, I never messed a day in my life with um, drugs, but I had a problem with alcohol and not to the point where I drink every day or couldn't stop drinking, but just to the point of when I drank emotionally, I couldn't handle what was going in my system almost like as if when I would start to think of emotions or things that have happened or things that I'm thinking about, I almost black out and can't control what I do. Um, so that's a little bit of my backstory. Um, so for me, finding spirituality was a very rough road and never messing with, and I call them drugs, but never messing with natural medicine like mushrooms, ayahuasca, hape, things like that. Um, and if you don't know what those are, I'd be happy to explain them. And in each video, I'll go ahead and tell you about an experience that I've had. Um, but as of last year, in on January 6th through the 9th, I went to my first official spiritual retreat um, up by San Jose. And that was the first time I've ever put something in my body to go into myself and look deeper. And shortly after that, four months I would say passed by and I had two massive strokes one massive stroke and then the second one was um considered a TIA and I lost all hope in the doctors because I'm 31 years old and they're saying it's unusual for somebody your age you know they were trying to find the underlining thing none of my medical conditions were lining up with what was happening I was losing a lot of energy. I was barely able to stand some days. I was shaking most days. It was a very scary, scary time in my life. And so randomly they were offering a scholarship for another spiritual retreat. And I told my husband, like, you have to get me this, like, because we were just so tight on money with, you know, me not working and dealing with all that. I said, I think this, you know, like, what's the worst I have to lose? What is the worst I have to lose at this point? Like, it's my life over trying one more thing that the doctors wouldn't do for me. And I'll go into that video a little a little later on. I'll make a different video about all that. But what I want to talk about is day two of my second spiritual retreat. And on that day, you bring out um, Los Ninos. And what Los Ninos are considered is mushrooms. So it brings out your inner child. Um, and today, I just want to open up for everybody something called safe space. And if you don't know what that is, you might have heard of it. Um, we all have our own, you know, visions and um, 
sorry, my, my English is not that great. So I'm going to make up words and I'm going to say things and I'm going to hope you understand them. And if you don't hope, understand them, don't worry. I'm going to repeat them in a different way until you do understand them. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment below at any of this, um, at any, any part of this video, I'd be happy, more than happy to go into it and explain the best I can. Um, I've, I've been trying to write a book for the last year and I'm just not good with writing guys. Um, people say I really am great with writing because I don't talk like other people, but my hand to paper ratio does not want to happen. So I figured maybe this would be the next thing I thought about podcasts, but I just want to show you guys who I am. I want you guys to see me, whether you're watching this, looking at me or whether you're just hearing it as you're driving or as you're doing it. But, um, going on with your day, you know, when bits and parts at a time. Um, but what safe space is to me, and you know, this is all my truth. So whatever you hear today is my truth. I just want you to know that it's okay. If you have a different view or a different opinion, that's absolutely okay. All I'm asking you to do is open up safe space as where we can say things and we can trust that you guys are gonna, you know, um, be okay with hearing those things. That doesn't mean you have to take them on. That doesn't mean you have to try and fix things. That doesn't mean you have to do anything but just hold safe space and what safe space is um as i've been doing more spiritual circles sometimes we like to go and say something and wrap it around to somebody's perspective to where they can understand it and then that's all turning our truth and i don't want to do any of that today so i just want to speak freely and openly and if you do hear me start to say something that maybe it was inaccurate and i'm trying to adjust it to make it sound better or to make it sound more understanding I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I lied about that. And this is what I mean to say. Um, I was talking to a, a friend yesterday, a really close friend of mine. And she said, she's like, I am invested after like three minutes of hearing my story. And so I figured, you know what? I have not gone on and actually talked about my experience with everybody because all of a sudden I was the girl that was having strokes and was told she was dying. And many people thought I was over exaggerating. Many people thought I was, um, maybe attention seeking. I don't know. Maybe some people thought that in my head, I believe that I don't know. All I know is that that was my truth. That's what was happening to me. And I went to the spiritual retreat and I came back somebody else. And so today I want to talk about that day. So, <laughs> so I went on July 1st, I believe. And I came back on July 4th. Um, from this spiritual event. And so I want to talk about the Nino Santos day and the Nino Santos day was the mushrooms day. And for me, the first time I'd ever taken mushrooms with an intention, they said it might've been the most powerful mushrooms they'd ever given <laughs> at a retreat. Like they were just insanely powerful. And boy, did I learn a lot about what I was being guided to. And I will talk about that again in another video. Um, I just remember anything that we say here today, like in the safe space, I know I'm jolting around and I'll get used to talking to you guys. Um, eventually as the videos go, I do more and more videos. Um, but you might hear some insane things and that's okay to say insane things as long as we don't act upon them. And as long as we don't do those things and we don't, we continue that safe space. It's okay to think any thought like, and I'm talking about like the worst to worst, like I want to murder a baby. Like, who wants to say that? Like, who wants to do that, right? It's okay to think those things. It's okay as long as we don't act upon them, okay? Because that's when we're ruining the safe space, right? And then we're trying to harm somebody or ourselves, and that's when there is no more safe space, and we have to handle things differently. So you guys might hear some crazy things today. Um, okay, so let's start. I took my tea, and we we're in a room, you know, we're in a circle, a circle, we're spaced out. Um, the shaman has given us our cup of tea. We start to drink it. And I know, I know that feeling now because it's my second time doing it. I know when that feeling comes on, I can't handle myself. So if anybody has never tried mushrooms, I don't want to scare you away from this. Um, it can be very powerful if your intentions, with your intentions in, you know, in present, um, cause the medicine will listen to what you're asking for, but be careful what you ask it. Cause it will show you what you're asking for. Um, but they knew what was going on with me. So they knew at this retreat that they were very specifically told to like, go help her in any way possible. Um, because they've already dealt with me once and they've known me and they cared, they came to, um, appreciate me as a person. And so this shaman definitely went out of his way to, to help me because if I'm not guided in a situation like this, I'm one of those people that you cannot give mushrooms to and walk away. I will tell you that. <laughs> 
okay so this medicine is sacred to me but at the same time i don't trust myself on it and that's okay it's okay that i don't trust myself yet why maybe i'll have to do some mushrooms and figure out why um so being a sober person my first feeling when i take this tea is oh my god am i losing my sobriety date oh my god like what are people gonna think of me oh my god what am i doing and like instant regret why did i choose to do this like i have be three beautiful kids at home i have a loving husband at home i have a business i need to be doing and i'm over here doing this so that feeling comes on those emotions come on and um the poor me instantly hits right and so that's when i know like he starts guiding us through this like meditation throughout our whole body and all of a sudden i feel this buzz of energy and i know immediately like okay it's time so i go right to the shaman i'm not one to ever ask for help but i know at this point like i have to ask for help i've learned that from the first retreat and i immediately go to him and i say i'm ready um and we walk outside and we go sit by this tree and it's like um it's like um a stepping stone to nothing but there's just steps there by a tree and we go a little ways up and i sit by that tree and i find shade and he said okay we're gonna do something and he's like and i've done this before with him so i know it's possible but it's still on my mind it's not open i'm not very spiritual I, I'm opening to, I'm the kind of person that believes when I see it, I will believe it. And I have now seen it, so I now believe that certain situation. And so that's where I was at. So he had me close my eyes, think of a number and a color that resonates with it. He told me to pick on the spot that was hurting. And so for that was my mouth. Okay, guys. So when I had this stroke, I think it's very important for you guys to know this. When I had the stroke, I was in a meeting hall and all of a sudden I was standing there and whack just instantly felt like somebody slammed my face like smacked it and it went through my face and into my mouth and i remember going like like that and i'm an energetic person like people think i'm high on the air which i probably am i'm high on life right and i was called to share and i literally cannot recollect like exactly what i said but i just remember my i was dizzy i was spinning and i instantly said hey I don't know what happened, but I'm like over there stressing in the corner. My life is good today. And I think I'm just going to sit down. And right after that meeting, I hopped on my Harley. I rode home. It was about three minutes away. I came inside the doors. I sat down with my husband. I sat right down next to the couch. And I said, I said, you know, I'm not feeling well. I said, I have this like stress in my face and it won't go away. My tongue is like clenching. And immediately I went to stretch my tongue, if that makes sense. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you guys. I went like this and I went, <laughs> it's not a pretty face, but that's what I did. And I instantly stretched out my tongue and a jolt went from here to here. I literally froze. My head was up like this. I was clenching the couch. I was saying something to my husband. Apparently I wasn't saying anything. I was word scrambling, which is a sign of a stroke, correct? And I wasn't making any sense to him. And then all of a sudden, like a minute went by, two minutes went by. It felt like it was lasting forever and then it stopped. And then I was like able to like speak again, but I was dizzy. It was so much going on. And my husband goes, I don't, I was like, I don't know what just happened. And he's like, well, you weren't making sense. You were trying to tell me something. I was like, I was telling you to help me. Like I was in pain. Like, why aren't you helping me? He's like, that's not what you were stating. Like, and we looked up some symptoms and it said stroke. So I drove myself to the ER. I said, I think I just had a stroke. And they said, are you sure it's not anxiety? I said, I'm telling you, and you know, with my hair all crazy, cause I'm a hairstylist and that's my like number one advertisement, my crazy lipsticks I always wear. And the way I looked, they just thought she wants painkillers or she wants something. And I said, I'm telling you right now, I was crying. I was in pain. All of a sudden my whole left side wasn't working after I got to the ER, drove myself to the ER. They left me in the waiting room for about two, two, maybe two hours. And they finally came and got me. And when I told the doctor what had happened, he legit took me back to the 1900s, bro. He was like, 
I want to call your husband. I need your husband to verify some information for me. Walked into the other room with my phone and said, I need you to explain your side of the story. He told him exactly what I had said. He came running in and said, she's had a stroke. Get a CAT scan immediately. Treat her like a stroke victim now. So they only took me serious when my husband backed me up. When a man backed me up. That's, that's, my, that's my view of it. My view is, I'm young. There's no way she can be having a stroke. She's making this up. Literally, my, my tongue's hurting talking about this. <laughs> so that's what happened. And from that day on, they couldn't explain what was happening, what was continuing to happen, why it was happening to me. And stroke victims from the age of 30 to 45, sometimes it doesn't even show on the CAT scan because it hasn't formulated in our brain or something like that. So there was just no proof that I had a stroke. And then they couldn't explain everything that was happening. Low cholesterol, but high blood pressure, but this, but that. And the weakness and the passing out and the shaking. And all of a sudden my left side's not working. And so I had to get outside help. And so my husband suggested mushrooms because I had already taken them out the first retreat. But taking them without an intention, without somebody spiritual next to me, it just doesn't work the same for me. And of course, now when I look back on it, I was also asking the wrong questions. I felt like I was dying. So I asked it, am I dying? Over and over and over. And it kept showing me I was dying. It kept showing me, get your burial ready. Get your life insurance together. Say goodbye to your kids. Get your husband ready. You know, get him ready for what he's going to have to do without you. Because we had two, three, we have three young kids, two, three, and seven at this, at this point in life. And I almost started to give up. And some people will say, the more you say it, the more it will happen. The more you put it out there, the more you'll start to believe it and you can kill yourself and yada, yada, yada. Everybody has their own opinion on it. But what I knew is I was dying. And so is everybody, right? We, we, we get born and we, we grow to die, you know? But it wasn't that kind of death. It was something coming fast and coming quick. And so all this is hitting me at the same time, right? So I'm sitting on that tree. I'm sitting by that tree. And I finally close my eyes. I grab my tongue. Literally like this. I'm grabbing it. And he's all like, you don't have to do all that. Just grab near it. And I'm like, no, I need to hone in on this because something is telling me something spiritual, some kind of spirit, some kind of guide of mine. Something is telling me, grab that thing and don't let it go until this is resolved. And to be honest, when I got to that second retreat, I thought the first thing that would help me was going to be the combo. And we'll talk about that in a different video, but that wasn't even nearly what I needed. And it's always the thing that I dread the worst that ends up giving me the most help. And that is the Nino Santos for me. That is mushrooms. And so I'm closing my eyes. I'm really trying to get into it. I'm trying to see a color. Nothing's coming up. Nothing's coming up. All of a sudden, like a really fiery red orange comes up. And I'm like, okay, I got a color. And he goes, pick a number one through nine. And my instinct is always to pick number two because that's what I love the most. I love the number two. So I'm going to pick the number two. I'm like, something's telling me number two. And, and I'm like, but that's not it. And he's like, well, call two-year-old Gingy in here. Like, bring your inner child out. She can help with this. She can guide this. And then all of a sudden, I'm seeing orange and red, and nothing's making sense. I'm closing my eyes. Nothing's appearing. I can't feel anybody. I can feel, like, a sense of something around me, but it's not a two-year-old. And so, again, I'm closing my eyes. All of a sudden, there's these, like, weird like monkey things and they're doing this weird dance and it's all in like a prism style and they're going in circles and I'm like none of this is making sense like just something makes sense and he's like focus keep closing your eyes the more you believe that something's going to happen the more that something is going to happen but you have to open it up you have to open yourself up to safe space I was never open to helping myself at all because I feel like I'm a less worthy person that doesn't deserve doesn't deserve to live but why Maybe my past, maybe my childhood, maybe my past lives. I don't know. But then just something clicked. And then what's weird about the experience is if you ever take mushrooms, you feel this weird feeling, right? I had none of that. It's as if I was talking to you today. Clear as day right now. Nothing. None of, I felt an energy, but there was no weirdness. There was no like, whoa, I messed up. It was literally as if I was having a conversation with you right now. But while closing my eyes. And so I close my eyes and then all of a sudden, it's almost like a book and a chapter, like in a book, like chapters. And I just go, and it goes, whew, whew, whew. and I see three grades of like 
white light go by. And I explained to him, and my eyes are obviously making this like, whoa, 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 what's happening, right? And he's like, okay, what's happening? Something's happening. And I was like, it's like as if like I changed, like I changed three pages in a book. And he said, okay, well, we're three lifetimes ago. He's like, that's, that's profound. That's, that's something really great. If they're showing you this, that's like, that is hard to get to. And so I go, okay. And then something in the corner of my eye up here was bothering me. And it's almost like a neon sign of like an outline of like a bird. Okay. And I'm just like, in my mind, go away, go away. I am ADHD. I am freaking ADD. I cannot focus. You're in the corner of my eye. Like, go away. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. Leave that there. That's your guide. That's going to be your guide today. Any questions you may have that you cannot find the answer to, you can ask that guide. It's there to help you. It's been sent, yada, yada, yada. And this is like, you know, as much as I can remember, because again, I'm not good at writing. So I maybe should have wrote more of this down. And all of a sudden, this guide is there. And all of a sudden, it's just like, have you guys seen Bruce Almighty when he's like in the heavens and it's just like a plain white place and it can turn into like an office building or whatever he's in. But in Bruce Almighty, he's walking and he can feel himself walking. So I see myself walking all of a sudden and I'm walking away and again, my eyes are closed. And then all of a sudden in the distance, I see a body and it's a lady and she's laying there and I can't see who she is. So I walk closer and, you know, I'm explaining all this to the shaman as it's happening. And I say, there's somebody there. And I'm walking towards it. And I was like, look at her face. It looks like me. It's not me, but it looks like me. And I'm like, oh my God. It's like, I just knew it was me. It's me, but it's not me. And he said, okay, okay. Maybe it's you three lifetimes ago. And she's wearing this like 1800s outfit. And there's a wagon around her, a rusted wagon around her all of a sudden. And now it's giving me like the holes vibes from that movie, like the whole vibes, um, that kid movie. And, you know, back in the day, like the kissing Kate, you know, lady, and she's in this long gown and this bluish top and she's laying there. And so I look away and I'm just pondering and I'm thinking, and all of a sudden I look back and now she's dead. Now she's just skull and bones and very, very scary looking to me, but I just couldn't take my eyes off of her and as that was happening all of a sudden I look at my feet and there's sand and water's rising and I'm like oh, like what is going on and, and all of a sudden there's a river I'm in a river and that's when she grabs me and she says like help me like help me and I tell him like she needs my help like like I don't know what's going on but I can see that she's been brutally murdered and it's very, very crazy to me. And I'm the person that always wants to help somebody, even if it's not in my best interest. Even if I know it's going to kill me, I'm going to help you. And so he's telling me, okay, that's fine, but you need to walk away. You need to walk away because we need to work on you right now. We'll come back and we will help her, obviously, but now is not the time. And I kept secretly not listening to him. I kept secretly trying to get her out of that river and carry her body. But every time I lifted her, I drowned or we were back to square one where she was right there on the ground again. And finally he was like, listen, you either are going to choose to do this or you're going to choose to move on. And I said, listen, I'm trying to talk to her, but she is stubborn. She was like, just a skull there going like, I'm not talking to you. Like her eyes were like this. Like I knew it was me. Cause have you seen my eyes when I'm like, no, <laughs> like that is the stubborn in me, right? Like this is my stubborn face. And that was the face of the skull. And finally, I was like, dude, she is not listening to me. And somehow he's like, okay, fine. Put her on the line with me. Because she knew that I was talking to somebody. So she sensed that there was somebody else there. And immediately she looked at me with that look. And then she looked away. And she was looking straight into the distance where my shaman friend was on the other side. And he said, okay, let her talk to me. I don't know if I was telling him what was going on. I don't know if they were telepathically talking. I don't know what was going on. But all I know is that they had a conversation. And their conversation went like this. He said, she said, you know, I'm here. I need help. Do not tell her to leave us. And he basically was like, listen, like you're obviously connected to her, but whatever you're doing is killing her. It's very clear that she is dying right now. 
you are depleting all her energy. Now that I know that you're there and you're with her, you are depleting every single ounce of energy she has. And if you do not let her go for this weekend, she will die. And then none of you will find healing. It's been the first person to find healing in her family for how long? And you're going to take this away from her. So you either step aside and we come back and we will help you. And he even made a joke about, we will bury you. We will go to the river tomorrow and we'll bury you. And we'll even bring beef jerky and call it a date. And then he was like, I can't hear her anymore. What is she saying? And I said, she's not saying anything. He goes, well, she didn't say no. So let's go. And at that point, finally, I was able to just detach and walk a little bit this way. And as soon as I did that, this very energy filled experience started to happen where I saw my dad. And let me go back before I tell you I saw my dad, because one of the things I didn't mention is we started to ask her some questions. And this is where it became very serious. Where he's like, Gingy, I need you to be very serious and very real with me right now. And do not lie to me. Because I need to know. And the first thing I said when she was brutally murdered. Because I knew she was brutally murdered. And I saw this picture of a guy. It was like an army sign. Almost. Like, like an Uncle Sam. Like, but there was a guy in a suit and he had a rope in one hand. And he said, you. And he's just, just like that. You. And I was like okay, like, he's looking at her like, you, you, and I, he's like, okay, I need you to ask your guide, like, did he murder her, and I said, I asked my guide, and my, the light lit up, so I knew he had murdered her, he said, I need to know, were you a witch, nothing happened, I wasn't a witch, and all of a sudden, this vision came on of me in a house, and I was making something by the stove, and I was putting it in a glass jar, and my husband had come home, and he saw that I was doing it, he said, you know, he's fighting me for that bottle. He's trying to get it from me. He's like, I already told you, no, no, no. And like, you got to stop helping other people. And it was basically, he was so worried that I was helping everybody else. Like maybe I was a healer in that generation. All I know is that I was making things for people and helping them. And he did not want that. He wanted me to help him and us only. And it was all about, you know, dominance and like, you're not going to do anything I tell you not to do. You're not going to be helping people. So he went to the community basically and was like, hey, like basically try to state that I was like doing things. And everybody kind of looked at him and shrugged for a second and was like, she helps us with our bunions. Like we're not, we're not getting rid of her. Like we like her. <laughs> it was like basically like that. Like we like her. We're not getting rid of her. And so we went to a river and there I saw as he brutally forced her over the river took advantage of her because that was one of the questions he asked me did he sexually abuse you and he did and took advantage of me and then brutally started murdering me like like rocks hitting the face and I could feel all this happening as if it was me and then all of a sudden a strangle and the strangle is what killed her and at that moment he looked around like for the community like I don't know what happened. I just took care of it. And that was that. That was the end of it. I didn't see what the rest of it happened. And it turned into him having a bunch of babies. And when he had the specific baby, the next generation that kept coming from the line, right? He had that. And then I just see my husband at that lifetime weld into my dad in this lifetime. And I was like, mind blown, right? So my husband that brutally murdered me in that lifetime is my dad in this lifetime. Currently, to this day. Do I believe it? Do I not believe it? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I saw. So at that point, when he asked me to move on at that point, I see my dad. He's like a glow of an image. Like just an outline, a white line, very sad. I feel like my dad has always had a very sad face. I feel like he gave me some of his sadness but who I gave the most sadness to is my son I could see it in his face the sadness the sad eyes I don't know if it's because my dad's a hard worker I don't know if whatever he's gone through in his life before us I can't tell you what it is there's just a sadness about him that makes me sad till this day and he's doing his normal thing like you know my dad is a very 
old and stubborn, very graphic person. At least that's my version of him. He loves in different ways. His love language is not hugs and kisses and I love yous. His love is I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to tell you what I did to survive in this world kind of thing. And he's like, great, your dad's here. Let's, let's start healing. Let's start the healing. Offer him this healing. I said, dad, if you want to sit down with me and heal, I'm here for you right now. I need this. I don't really ask you for a lot, but I need this. Like I need answers. Whatever's going on in my body right now is obviously needing help. And he did his little shrug of, and he used to call, he calls me Corinne, right? Corinne with like an E because, you know, him and my mom had differences about how they wanted to spell my name. He's just like, Corinne, I'm done. Like I'm done with your bullshit. Like just go, go away. It's just that, that, that hand of like, I don't have time for this. It's like, but when do you ever have the time to heal? When will we ever? And I had to be so stern. This might be the sternest I've ever been with my dad <laughs> in a fake conversation right down to his face. And maybe it was easier because it was his image and not him. But I saw it instant, like, I'm embarrassed of you. I can't believe what you're doing right now. You know, because my dad's very logical. And he just wants the best of how he grew up and what he knows. All this, the rest of this is all random woo of the world, right? I said, I need this. If you decide to go, that's on you. But at least pass me whatever you need to pass me before you go so that I can heal because I need to move on. Obviously, my lifetimes need to move on because obviously we're going to keep recreating the same lifetime from now. And going to keep creating where we're near each other until we find what we needed to find, the answers we needed, or, or maybe the healing we needed to find. And he started to walk away, almost through this black portal. And then all of a sudden I just saw him sit down like a little boy and just sit there. I said, wow, he's sitting. He's here. He said, okay, start. So... From that moment, what I remember is him sitting down and the shaman guiding me to opening this thing up below me and asking my dad to just send all that, all that regret, all that pain, like, cause he didn't want to kill me. Right. He just didn't know how to handle me. And he thought that and somebody else would end up killing me or killing him or killing our next generation or our kids or so he thought he was doing the right thing. And maybe he was in that lifetime. Who knows? Everybody has their own rights and their own wrongs, right? And so he passed all that guilt and frustration to me. And as soon as he passed it through me, I passed it through that portal in the ground. And I didn't get to spend a lot of time on it because phew, all of a sudden my mom came into the picture. Now, my mom is not my birth mother, but she is very important to me. I love her too. She chose to change my diapers when my mom decided she would. My mom left. And, you know, I'm still kind of weird about the timeline because we don't talk about it often. I've asked my dad recently and we had a little bit of a conversation about it. I think the last time I've talked about it with my mom and dad was Ride to the Flags a couple years ago. And I got to learn a lot about my mom. I can't even honestly remember most of it. But my mom had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. And we got in this huge fight. She came over to my house and trying to be the good daughter, the one that has a clean house, the one that's taking care of her kids. And my mom was in pain. Her back was hurting. She just woke up one day and couldn't walk and her back was hurting. And they're very private about their life. So I didn't know anything was going on yet. I just knew that she had severe back pain. And I had just broken my back on a slide. I broke my tailbone or shattered it or whatever you call it. And maybe they didn't believe me because I sent a picture on Google of which part I had shattered, but I didn't have my actual x-ray. So maybe my, my sister's a doctor. Maybe she saw that and was like, that, that's not shattered. Uh, but I just sent them a picture of where they said it was shattered because they wouldn't release the x-ray to me. Um, and so, you know, in her, in her spirit, I always found excuses, which I've had. I've always had a poor me attitude, which I've had. I think we all have. 
and I was sitting down with ice on my back and she came and she sat down she couldn't carry the kids and there was a lot going on I'm excited to see my dad I'm excited to see her but I know she's mad at me and I know she's frustrated with me and my husband did something not so smart on her birthday and texted her a response to something she had said and he's not one to do that so I think he felt very sincere about what was happening like very emotional about what's happening he acted on his emotions and that's not how my mom does things and she said something I was like oh yeah I hurt my back too you know making it about me as usual maybe I do that a lot I'm sorry if I do but my main person is me right and she said something under her breath about bullshit let me see that x-ray prove it and at that point I just I went off I couldn't do it anymore kind of put on this fake persona and be that girl that, you know, my mom's Hispanic. You, you respect your elders no matter what because they raised you and they cared for you. And they are the wisest and they have the last word. And I couldn't do it. Something in me just blurted out, get the fuck out of my house. You're not going to come here. You're not going to say shit to me. You're not going to say shit to my kids or at least in front of my kids. I don't deserve this. My dad has no clue what's going on. And he's just like, wait, you just need to calm down. That's his favorite thing. You just need to calm down. You need to relax. Oh, and that, that sends me off, right? One of the last things my mom said to me was, God rest your soul. I said, I'm done. Just get out of my life if you're going to act like this. And my dad walked out the door because he backed up my mom. As he should. She's an amazing wife. Amazing. She did so many beautiful things for my dad. She's taken care of him for 30 years, right? She's taken care of us. Children that weren't even hers. And her last words to me were, I'm going to have a great life now that you're not in it. And she walked out. She said something along the lines, I only came here to talk to your husband about his shit that he said to me. And how dare he? And I didn't even let it go on. My, my husband stayed quiet. Smart. <laughs> he stayed quiet. She walked out. My daughter's crying to me and yelling at me what did you do mommy you made her go away all I wanted to do was see my grandma she never liked grandma so we'll call her M she likes to be called M so my mom comes into this vision bam just in my face I'm like so excited yet so mad yet so frustrated yet so sad and she just hugs me she hugs me a hug I haven't I don't remember ever getting a genuine hug and I'm ready to tell her so much and she says I love you I said I love you too and I said I've always loved you you mean everything to me and maybe and your culture was different and I don't think it's right some of the things you've done in my life. Definitely not okay. Some of these things were definitely not okay. They're not first world punishments. They're not. They're just not okay. Some of the things maybe my dad's never seen even. Some of them he has in his love. Some of them he never saw. Some of them were just word of mouth and whatever she said he believed. And I know she was always just trying to get me to be the best person I could be. She was so strict on me, so harsh on me. She knew I could be more. And I learned that during a coaching call, actually. I said, my parents don't agree with me. They don't want the best for me. She goes, really? Well, what does your mom say when you work here? Well, I'm a hairstylist. And she says, but I could be doing so much more that I'm just a hairstylist. Like, why am I choosing to do this? And in her culture, it was pity work. It wasn't great work. She was a hairstylist, and it wasn't, like, it was, ew, like, you, why would you want to be a hairstylist, especially over there in a third world country? And she goes, I think your mom and dad love you. Your mom and dad could be like, going, why are you doing hair? You should be working at McDonald's. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You could be, they could be downgrading you, but they see your potential, which means they love you so much. It's a different kind of love, though. You need to learn those signs of love. And since that day, I've never, ever thought that my parents didn't love me. 
I had always thought that because I didn't hear the I love yous, the I'm proud of yous, the hugs, the kisses. I didn't get that. I didn't really see that from my children either. So I thought, they must not love me. But she loved me so much. So I told her, I love you so much. And just in your next lifetime, don't do it that way. Find another way. Find another way to love. And she went into her enough, enough, enough for both of us. She was crying. I was crying. She said, I need you to make a decision. I said, okay, I need you to pick between me or your dad. Well, first of all, what kind of decision is that, right? Like, I did the two people I love the most. But of course, I'm going to pick my dad. Because I loved you, but I felt like sometimes you were mean. Sometimes you didn't love me back. Some of the punishments were cruel. I said, of course I picked my dad. I was okay saying that. It was okay. I felt calm inside when I said that. She said, good. Now I need you to tell your dad something from me. And at this point, I'm starting to realize, wait, she's here. She's in this retreat with me. Like, did something happen? Is she gone? And I'm crying as if I am crying now with my eyes still closed. And Mikey, my shaman friend, said, listen, just take it in. Whatever she's got to tell you, listen very carefully. Wherever she's at now, whether she's still in the living world or not, it's nothing to do with you. But you need to hear what she has to tell you. It's her deathbed. Listen closely. I need you to tell your dad to stop helping me. Stop healing me. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to move on. And my mom, she is a fighter. She will never tell you when something's wrong. You will never know she is having a bad day. Most people didn't even know she had cancer until she died. She was able to keep that because she didn't want people to feel sorry for her. She didn't want people to think less of her. She was a strong individual. That's something I'll never forget. God rest her soul. She said, she said those words. I said, okay. I said, I don't know how to tell him. I'll find a way. Because even though we weren't talking, I sent her a grounding blanket because it helped me a lot with the stroke stuff. So I knew it could help her. My dad said she loved it so much she got a full-size blanket for her bed. But we're sending her all these healing things. My dad was later, I find this out later, that he's driving all the way to Orange County to help with treatments and these other things and nothing's getting like a show might get a little better but it just always worsened so maybe my mom didn't have the heart to show that she was ready to go I don't know I was just told to tell her that and then like a cloud she just evaporated and I felt like she was gone I told my dad I might have just killed my mom she said this has nothing to do with you stop making it about you I said but what if I go home and she's not there Like, what if me finding healing has caused her pain? He said, that's that's her own journey. She's made every decision in her life. And obviously, she's telling you the decision she wanted now. So, obviously, I didn't go home and tell my dad. I didn't know how. I did have a little conversation with him afterwards about it. I did tell one of my sisters. And my sister was so angry. I told her that. How dare you say that? She is always a fighter. She wants to live. I've seen her. I've talked to her in the hospital. She wants to be here. How dare you go and make that assumption? She had every right to think that. But she didn't see and feel and hear what I heard and what I felt and what I knew. So I kept to my truth. I just said, that's my truth. That's my truth. My mom passed away a few months. few good months afterwards, maybe four or five months afterwards, after that retreat. I never got to say goodbye in person. She didn't want me to. That was one of her wishes. To not see me or my family. And that's okay. I had already said my goodbye. And I'm so grateful for that alone 
even if this didn't help me with the strokes, I'm so grateful for that alone. Closure, right? So there, from there, we start to move on. I'm starting to feel lifted. I kind of still feel a presence of my dad in the corner. I'm going through a bunch of things and then, bam, it's just like a circle of people around me. Four or five big people, almost like gods in the sky having a, a meeting kind of like Zeus right all in a circle and I just know instantly I'm in trouble I am in so much trouble I don't know what for but I can feel it like I am like I'm on the chopping block so Mikey I, I think I'm somewhere I'm somewhere I'm being judged I'm being looked at right now I'm being reviewed like, there's contracts involved. Like, I just immediately know that there's some things involved. Like, maybe that I've been through this before. I'm not sure. He said, okay. They're going to offer you something. You better make sure you know what you're signing. You better make sure you know what you're taking on. You better understand what you're leaving here with today. And so, all of a sudden, these beings started talking. And I said, you know, in every lifetime... Go out of your way to help people. You go out of your way to heal people. To be their friends. You take on all their stuff and don't even worry about your own. And in the process of taking... And, and, and from people that don't even want your help on the side of the street, they go, no thank you. You still try and help them. And you take on all these energies. And then you get very sick in every lifetime. And then... You come crying to us. Help me. Help me, I'm dying. And I'm like, ooh, okay, my bad. I didn't know helping people and doing good. That's something my dad has always said to me. Something that he said to me in that lifetime when he was my husband. He said, you're always worrying about everybody else. You're always helping everybody else, but never helping your own family, never helping yourself. And wow, he's right. He has a point. He's not wrong. He's not wrong at all. I do. Why do I help everybody else and not myself? I feel like I help myself. By helping other people, I meet the most incredible people. And somewhere down the line, maybe not those people, but a stranger helps me. I have been gifted so many things in this lifetime alone. Like that my husband's like, what? They gave you a what? They did this what? He said, we just got a car for our wedding passed down to us. And that all comes from me helping other people. In my thoughts, that's what I believe. But anyways, I find out that I've only lived about 30, roughly 30 to 35 years in each of these lifetimes. So if you do the math, it takes you back to the exact timeline that this lady was from, the late 1800s. I've done the math on this, guys. I, I was bound to prove that none of this was right, none of this was happening, none of this existed, that this, like, is, this is just mumbo-jumbo. But three lifetimes puts me in the clothes she was wearing, puts me in the lifetime that I was at, puts me where I am at today. But in all my lifetimes, I died early, in my roughly around my 30s. Does that scare me now? A little bit. But I've, I've come to terms with that because now I know what to do. So they said, we're going to make a deal with you. If you want to help people, learn the right way to do it. I want you to save your hugs for those you love most. For those you want to pass your energy on to and receive from. That was a big thing in the rooms of AA. You hug people. You hug people you don't even like. Because you want to welcome them. Because you want to treat how you were treated when you first walked in the room. And then you go talk shit about them behind their backs later. There's very little people in that program that do everything. That talk the talk and walk the walk. There's very few people like that in the program. But it's only because we're human. We're human. We all make those mistakes. We all do it. We all say that we're this and that. I try to stay very true to my word, but that doesn't mean I don't mess up. I was literally in a meeting once and I was like, I don't judge people, da 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 da. And somebody wrote on the thing something that I had a question about and they misspelled it. And I was like, whoa, who wrote this kind of shit? Like, y'all need to be like working on your vocabulary, even though I can't write. And there you are judging people, Gingy. A lot of people were like, what? So I'm not going to say I haven't done it either. But you give a lot of hugs. You give a lot of things away to people in these rooms. Some of them don't even want it. Some of them 
only have to talk to you because their sponsor is telling them to say hi to you because you guys don't get along and you guys should just be cordial and all those kind of things, right? So I said, whoa, that's going to be a big one when I go back to the meetings. Not to hug people like, sorry, can't take on your energy. But I said, okay. I said, if you are going to help people, you're going to do it on Mother Earth. You're going to do it for Mother Nature. You're going to make sure you're standing over Mother Nature. You're going to make sure you're not taking on their stuff. You can help. You can guide. You can heal. But do not pass on any energies or take on any energies of theirs. You better be very clear about that. I said, okay. And if you do all this, and if you sign this contract, we will give you your life back. No idea what that meant. Give me my life back. Okay. Sign my name on that scroll. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this hand came out and choked me. And I was like, what is happening? I'm being choked. <sighs> Strangled again, right? And I was like, this cannot be happening. But as they were strangling me, all of a sudden it felt so good. My throat, every little notch in my throat, in my neck, in my head, in my tongue, in all of a sudden I saw all of my elements, all of my muscles, everything. And it was like crackle and pop going up with white light. And then it turned golden. And everything was just popping, 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 popping up and down. And I took a deep breath and I felt rejuvenated. Like, oh my God, like this is life. Like I'm alive. And I was like, whoa. And then all of a sudden I start laughing. And it's like the shaman's like, what is so funny? Like literally, what can be so funny right now? I was like, oh, Michael's going to be a little, maybe a little happy about this, my husband. I said, I said, this is now your sacred area. You don't let anybody near this area ever again. This is your sacred area. <laughs> and I just thought immediately, you know, in the bedroom, redhead. And what did you, it's true what they say. Sorry, dad, if you ever listen to this. But I was always like, hey, get a little rough. <laughs> and I said, this is now, you will protect this with all of your existence on this earth till the day you die you will protect this from now on i said well michael's gonna have some bad news when i get home or happy news and i don't think he ever liked doing it anyways <laughs> and mikey just starts laughing because he knows my husband the shaman's just laughing like god jesus gingy like seriously and so they said if anybody ever comes and tries to harm you basically tries to strangle you, you fight you didn't fight in that lifetime. You better fight. You better fight. You better go out with a fight. You better protect yourself as much as you can. And poof, that was the end of it. They left. I didn't get to ask them any questions. Like, how do I heal correctly? If I'm a healer, how do I send these energies? How do I do what I do? Why would you give me healing if I can't use it on anybody? I have so many unanswered questions, guys. But again... And I'm stealing this from somebody else. What is the purpose of the process? What is my purpose of this process? And maybe that's what I was... Maybe that's why I wanted to come to this lifetime and live this life of who I am today with the parents I've had, with the children I have today, and with the life I was given to learn something, to get more... to get more wisdom. So maybe I've yet to learn all that. I've started to, and I'm finding my way. And it scares me every day I offer a spiritual circle or a hop a one-on-one -on -one session. Because I can do something phenomenal. I see phenomenal results in people that I do one-on-one -on -one hop is with or in small spiritual groups. Phenomenal things I've seen from the people that I've done. And I'm not talking like one or two. I'm talking every single person I've helped. Like a life-changing experience, at least for that day. And I'm so like, what is it? what is it to help? What is it to guide? What is it to share my wisdom and not go over that line of that contract I signed? So after that, all of a sudden, my kids come into the picture and I'm talking to my kids telepathically. And I'm like, mom is going to healing. And then 
Carly comes up and she's with her dad in Tennessee at the moment for summer break and she's crying that she doesn't want to be there and I'm like Harley like I love you and he's like reminding me the shaman's reminding me she chose this life just like you chose to be in this lifetime you guys are not here by accident you chose to be here you asked to be here and you asked to be in this situation to learn something so she's got to learn whatever she needs to learn to deal with and cope with that and it was just a bunch of telepathically talking to them and it's all kind of like a haze at this time and I just remember saying we're all just going to take one giant dump tomorrow and we're going to release all these bad energies and we're going to move on as a family and for some reason I always say that on mushrooms like if you can't release it during today like release it tomorrow through whatever comes out of my body and leaves like and so that happened and I opened my eyes and I looked at Mikey and I thanked him and he said, okay, time for me to move on and to, to go help other people. I think it must have been three or four hours we were doing this. The experience seems fast, but it must have been three or four hours we were going through that. And immediately I feel and a release of energy. I start opening my eyes. Like, you know, like when you open your eyes after you're like, you've been closing them and you're outside and you're like, whoa, like the world just looks different to you. And all of a sudden smack <laughs> the mushroom like the mushroom fizzy starts to come on and I'm feeling messed up like whoa I can barely walk everything's looking alive I could smell the lavender plant from like a half a mile away I could see the bees slowly going by me and saying like here we're not here to sting you we're just here to pass you by so and my four-year-old self comes out and says I want you to get into that cold water at the pool and I'm like what and he's like, go enjoy yourself. Go relax now. And like, I'm like, everybody's like happy and coming down from everything. And I'm just starting to go into the mushrooms. Like just the mushroom part of being like messed up. And I'm like, what in the world? And not sign up for this. So people are trying to talk to me. I'm like, no, right now. So I got my bathing suit on as fast as I could. I sat there by the pool. And all my four-year-old self was asking me to just dunk your head in. Dunk your head in. Just like, it would not stop. And so finally, I was so scared. I was so scared of dipping myself in this shallow little man-made pool and finally I got the nerve to do what I did and I went under and I came up and I felt gray I felt tired I felt weird and I can hear the laughing from from the kitchen people are enjoying food now they're you know they're they're coming down they're enjoying their food their experiences are over they're talking about things um, one thing we were taught is not to be the savior, the executioner and I know there's one more so not to if somebody's crying to go in into there I'm like oh do you need me do you need a hug? Like, you know, and I remember hearing them and one person particularly is laughing over everybody else and I can't stand it. And it's just like, it's so fake to me. It's like, you're just trying to be louder than everybody else. Every time somebody's loud, you're just being louder and more obnoxious. And like, I don't know. I just got this feeling of, I was pissed off and I needed to walk away. And I went into the room and there's this lovely girl and she's like, Oh my God, like, how are you? She's like, I cannot believe what's going on right now. She's like, I'm just like mind blown. It was her first retreat. And she's like, Whoa. And I was just like, yeah, I'm feeling like that too, but not in a good way. And all of a sudden I just start crying. And one of the things I forgot to mention, he said, okay, Jinji, in every lifetime, in this lifetime alone, Every time something gets a little hard for me, I want to go. I'm like, just like, why do I got to be here? Like, why is I, like, I got to remember that I asked to be here, right? And whining, the poor me attitude, and da-da-da-da-da. And he said, Gingy, be different. When those things come on, be different. Be the person that you just saw. Be the person, be the strong person. Like, I knew you were a healer. I knew you were capable so much the first time I met you. But you got to hone in on that. You got to stop giving excuses like, okay, I tried. It's not working and I'm done. Like, I've given it my all. Did you really? No. I give it a couple minutes and I quit. And I'm like, maybe this isn't for me. And I'm always second guessing myself. And there's always a lot going on. So we had talked a little bit about that. Like, no more saying that. Like, if you want to be here, be here. You asked to be in this lifetime, fulfill this lifetime for as long as you have. And stop complaining about it. And stop complaining that you just want to take the easy ride out. And so when I got in that room, I felt that. And all of a sudden, I see the, the lady. She's there and she's just sitting on my chest. A dead person sitting on my chest. Sideways, laying there. And she's just weighing me down. All of a sudden, I feel like I can't breathe. And she goes, oh, my God, I'm going to go get the shaman. Like, you're not okay. She runs and go gets him. He walks in like, I love this man. Gingy, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I'm having a panic attack. Things are happening. 
feel like I can't breathe. The real world's coming in right now. He's like, what just happened to those hours of work we did over there? Like, you either be who you want to be or you're going to cone on it. He's like, one thing I did forget to mention is that the old you is going to want to come back. And you're going to have to try in all your existence and power to be the new person, to bring in that new light. We just saw all the golden light come into you, so be that golden light. Whenever this comes in, throw in that golden light and remember who the fuck you are and why the fuck you're here and why the fuck you wanted to be in this world and to make a difference. You are here for a difference. Be that difference. Don't give up on yourself. You give everybody else attention, but then you give up on yourself. Don't do that. He said, now you're going to get over there into that kitchen and you're going to be a part of people, whether they're obnoxious or not to you. And you're going to be part of. And so I'm like, okay, but she's like just sitting here on me. Like, and you don't know what I'm dealing with. And the poor me attitude comes back. Right. But I'm like, okay. And I'm just marching up to the little hill and I'm just like, oh like sitting with these people and then all of a sudden I just get like super sad now I've found that on mushrooms this is this is how I am I have a profound experience an amazing experience not that I want to go back on it but like the real world just comes in and world twins me when I'm coming off of mushrooms and it's like you're broke you're not doing enough for your kids are you ever going to give them a house are you gonna is your husband ever going to get to the place he needs to be are you going to be the perfect like why aren't you like your mom that uplifted your dad all those years and made him the man he is and provided the family and the house and the this and the that and I'm so broke like what do I do do I go bankrupt do I not go bankrupt do I keep the business I am do I stay in here and all these questions are happening at once guys and that is okay it's okay not to know the answers but Gingy inside wants to know the answers so bad and so I'm crying and when my buddy's like you know I I'm I don't want to be your savior so like I don't know if like I'm supposed to greet you or if I'm supposed to hear you out or if I'm supposed to let you speak and she just started telling me something about her experience and I started telling my experience and then the, the same person from that that room that helped me got the shaman started talking to me and we we're just talking about things and it's like you know but it's like how do they expect us to live in this world when we could barely make it they expect us to want to have kids to bring on the next generation and I was saying me and my husband have always had it was we're never going to be ready for children. We're never going to have enough money, enough wisdom, enough this. So we might as well just have the kids and go with the flow. And we've always done that. But I feel like it wasn't enough. I didn't have the big house or the backyard. I have an apartment. I didn't have the nicest car. I don't have the greatest job. It's not steady income. I don't know whether I'm going to get paid $1,000 tomorrow or $0 for the next two weeks. Like, it's not secure enough for what the life I wanted to give them. And just talking to somebody about it just made it all flow. And eventually, eventually I start to realize that it's it's leaning in, that I can breathe again. And I'm like, you know, obviously I need to go home and make some decisions. And talking to somebody actually helped her see some things and helped her make some decisions. And just, I feel like, guys, the reason I do this, what I want to end this with, I know it's been an hour of your time already, is that we're so keen on wanting to make the world look a specific way and this is what life's meant to be like and all the goods right with social media and all the ups you're seeing and nobody's seeing me cry and nobody's seeing the downs and nobody's seeing the struggle and when I am posting about the struggle how dare you post on Facebook your real life like that is nobody's business but yours and your closest friend and God and your church and the meeting hall and then the meeting hall is also for you to vent but it's not your fucking therapy room so go get outside help and if you can't get outside help because you're going to look out crazy because you're getting outside help and it's not the norm like there's all these things that we make the world look like but if I for anybody that's listening and that listened all the way through this I want you to know that I'm specifically talking to each person listening to this right now that I am here for you I'm holding safe space for you maybe you are struggling today maybe the story helped you a little bit to know that there's another person struggling like you I feel like when we talk about things like sex right sex is sacred we don't really talk about what we do in the bedrooms right with people and we don't really talk about like what we like and what positions and what floats our boat but I have I have talked to my clients about sex and orgies, not that I've been in one, but them being in some, and like, you know, it's got my curiosity, it's got my curiosity for this, or for that, or for anal, or whatever, and because I said those words, and somebody else goes, exactly the same, just we don't talk about that, we're not supposed to talk about religion, politics, sex, drugs, 
things like that, right? That's not a, a, a good communication to have with other people. That's meant for you to hold inside and not nobody to know. But then we feel like we're the only ones on the planet Earth right now. So if you feel like you're the only one dealing with certain thing, let me tell you, I'm voicing myself today. I'm telling you my story because I know I'm not the only one. And the more people bring it up and make it normal, the more you hear about it, the more you spread that knowledge that, hey, I'm confused about this too. Is this something I should do with my partner? Is this normal? Is this this? And they go, I don't know. I've always wondered that too. Or maybe they've done it and they give you advice. You're like, God damn, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one to feel like this. They've made me feel like I'm the only one and I better keep this secret because if anybody ever finds out, they will disown me. They will dislike me and I will never be part of society again. I don't want to be a part of that society. I want to be a part of society where if you had anything similar in your story to my story today, know that I am with you. There will always be struggles in life. There will always be ups and downs but we can get through anything. And the wisdom of this medicine that I took with an intention of finding out what was wrong with me cured my strokes. It cured me. And I'll go about into that in another story because I've taken an hour of your time already. And I'm hoping you want to listen to the next one. And I'm hoping you're intrigued by my experiences. And I hope that maybe from this video, I don't know how it works because I haven't downloaded YouTube. So my husband will be doing that with me tonight as a team. I hope maybe you subscribe or maybe you donate to help other people found what I've found. I do know this. Shamans have made this very clear to me. They feel, they believe that everything emotional, no, everything physical stems from something emotional. And I'm not talking about your feelings and your boo-hoos. I'm talking about something deep down inside. I truly believe that they could cure cancer. But if you do not handle the problem behind the emotion behind the cancer, it will come right back. I had to handle what was happening behind the strokes. And now that I know that those strokes weren't really strokes. After communicating with my husband when I got home from this whole experience, which I barely dibbled into today. I know, crazy, barely dibbled into it. I know this. I know that he told me when I was having those strokes, now that I told my story to him, he's intrigued by it all. He said you really think about it, you didn't look like you were having a stroke. You looked like you were being strangled. And so what I found is that when she came onto this life of existence somehow and she found my DNA, she was smacked right into my hand. For some reason it was in my mouth and I had this weird things with the strokes where I'm telling them like, it feels like somebody's like literally grabbing my tongue, like a ripping it out. Like, you know, like when they're about to mummify somebody and rip out their tongue, like in the mummy. That somebody's yanking down on my tongue and then somebody's yanking on my face 24-7. That was one of the hardest things from the stroke that I, like telling people, they're like, you have TMJ, you need to get Botox. Botox? Like it's not over here, it's in here. And it's in my muscles. And it feels like my, and then somebody told me my muscles could be dying. That from the lack of oxygen, if your muscle dies, it slowly keeps dying until it goes to a muscle that eventually your heart and you will die. So that scared the shit out of me. But that does make more sense. Because I wasn't spiritual, I'm not enlightened in any way. Her trying to show it to me was it actually happening to me. And I had no idea what was happening. And then once more, when she tried to show me again, she realized she was depleting all my energy. So she realized she was killing me. And she backed off because obviously she's attached to me now. She's one with me. So if I die, she dies with me. And we both don't get healing, right? So thankful, thankful to these shamans for helping me. There was more I had to do after this experience to completely get all my health issues to pass me by or to be done with. And I want to leave that story for another day because I think that's a whole story in itself. And so I hope what you take today with some wisdom, with some knowledge that if you put an intent behind anything, medicines, anything, and maybe your intention is just to get fucked up and have a good time. Kudos to you. Maybe your intention is to learn something more. Be cautious of what you're asking you. Deliver it with assertiveness. I hope that's the word. Assertiveness and with the right wording. Because that will change everything. Or maybe you just don't want, you just want to take an experience and learn that, you know, whatever you have to show me, guide me to. Maybe that's that. Maybe you don't have an an intention. But the medicine knows what you're feeling inside and knows that. So I no longer call it a drug. 
and now we'll call in medicine and obviously it's trying to get legalized in so many places and of course where they're going to charge you tons of money to go in and like to be facilitated and that and maybe that's what you need or maybe you can do it on your own whichever you choose just know that there are other ways and maybe you call me crazy for doing this experience i don't regret it i don't regret anything i've gone through i don't regret the strokes i don't regret anything that i've gone through to get to this point of healing to know where i am and i remember when we signed up for the first retreat i told my husband i fucking hate you i cannot stand you i'm in aa i meet you and you're not taking your program seriously and you're wobbling in and out and you're doing all these spiritual things right to get messed up and i owe him my gratitude he taught me something he showed me a whole other side to a world that i can still to this day not explain to you i have a little bit of more information on it i have a little bit more of an understanding on it but i cannot explain it to you till this day and everybody's experience will be different and everybody's experience will be to their own. But if you take anything from the story, know that this is a power. This is a power beyond any human that's capable. I choose to believe in a higher power. There's definitely a higher power. Now I know I have guides around me. And Jesus is one cool dude. I've had an actual conversation with him, and he's a cool dude. But I don't think what people portray him to be as is my understanding of who he was and what he wanted to show and that's okay you can believe your side and i'll believe my side it's just the knowledge that i've gained from this experience and who's to know if my truth is right my truth could be wrong but it's my truth it's what i'm true i can literally be telling you a lie right now and that is my truth because i'm saying it so at the time it is my truth because i believe in it right not that i'm lying to you guys but i've learned all this through spiritual events and very few and immediately went into my own and as the sun sets here today and we spent an hour and 11 minutes i want to thank you guys for your time thank you guys for holding safe space thank you for your grace i can't wait to make another episode this is something so new to me and i'm excited i'm excited to get it out into the world and to know that maybe you've gone through something or maybe you need to go through something and i'm not saying to go do medicines on your own and you know to each thy own be careful what you do and be responsible and be in safe hands and just know that i'm here for you and my guide my guides and my god and my higher power are here for you as well and whatever you're going through today I just want you to take a real quick deep breath and go. <sighs> Life's not that bad. It's what you're meant to go through. It's what you're meant to learn. Yeah, did that guy die in a burning crash? Was that like, that was what it was meant to be? It was. I don't know why, don't know how, but just trust in that. Trust in that and trust that you know that other people are going through things too and it's not just you. Not to take away from what you're going through because what you're going through is valid. And I can't wait to see all your comments. I can't wait to hear your stories. I can't wait to hear your words spoken out there. And I can't wait to make this world one. I think with our words we can make this world one again. With our stories. Because that makes us that defines who we are. We wouldn't be the person we are today without going through those stories. And everybody has a different story to tell. And one of the things I love to share is when I was drinking, I loved to talk to strangers. I loved it. One of the things I love to do sober now is talk to strangers. It's my favorite thing to do is to get to know somebody and hear their story on why I met them today and why I'm here with them today on why you're listening to this right now on YouTube and why you, you were called to listen to this. Maybe you're here to judge me. Maybe you're here to just really want to know what happened because I never really spoke about it. All of a sudden, I just got better from the strokes and I was moving on. And everybody's like, well, what the fuck happened? She had strokes and now she's fine. And all I said was I went on my spiritual retreat and it fixed it all. Did the shamans fix it for me? No, I had to do the work. You have to do the work if you want to do anything. I'll tell you, nobody's going to do it for you. And if they do it for you, you're not learning the lesson you came here to learn. You're not gaining the wisdom you needed. So I did it. With the help of somebody, thank God that there are people like that. This guy is a magnificent person. Mikey, I hope one day we can meet again. We can reconnect. All I know is that you are a gift from something else. Something that I cannot explain. You are a powerful person. You are a great person. 
and I can't wait to take everything I've learned from this day two experience and, and manifest it and put it into my life, which I have been doing. It has not been easy. It's so easy to go back to old Gingy and old Corinne and go back to where I was and say the things I was doing and believe in the things and the poor me. But it's an even greater experience to not do that and to to change and morph into the person that I was meant to be. And so, aho. Aho is a very shaman thing that I feel like I should know. I feel like it's like a thank you. Like a thank you for sharing. And I now pass my sharing stick to you guys. Can't wait to hear from you guys. Much love. Much kisses. I hope you guys loved the first episode of the Gingy Style. This is the way gingy right this is the gingy style this is me and this is how i do it and this is what i'm here to tell you in the world today i love all you souls thank you for listening i hope this left you with a surge of energy that just manifests greatness in your life and may you see another beautiful sunset and may we see another beautiful sunrise tomorrow